that you don't interrupt the speaker. Okay. So just to give a brief outline for today's talk, first I'm gonna share an introductory remarks then, which will be followed by public relations announcement. Then we'll, then our speaker, Caitlin Shell, she will give a great talk on a day in the life of a green chemical engineer followed by a Q&A session, then we will share about upcoming events and, and, and then we'll launch an exit poll for, for your re response following, following concluding remarks. So this, this program uh, is being sponsored in accordance with Chemists Celebrate Art Week, which is April 18 to the 24th. And the team this year is reducing our footprint with chemistry. As I mentioned before, this event is being sponsored by the Eastern US Younger Chemist Committee Partnership. And this screen shows some of the young, some of the local sections that are part of the partnership, including the Northern New York, Eastern New York, Rochester, Philadelphia, Virginia, um, Nashville, North Carolina, and St. Louis. We also have international groups that are part of, of it as well, including Puerto Rico, Brazil, and Morocco. So what is the Younger Chemist Committee? Our vision is younger leaders transforming the world through chemistry. Our mission is to advocate for, develop, and support rising chemists to positively impact their careers, the ACS, and the future of chemistry. You can also, you can get involved on the national level by attending YCC events at national meetings, or you can even apply for a YCC sponsored award. You can also get involved locally with your respective local sections, and you can get involved by attending go by in governance as well as outreach. If you, as an AC, if you're if you're an ACS member, some of the benefits of being an ACS member includes having access to career development and networking resources, such as the free ACS career consulting program. You'll have access to the chemical and engineering news database, career pathway workshops, ACS webinars, and additional programs. You'll also have the ability to, to be part of groups and committees such as technical sections, technical divisions, student chapters, and international chapters as well. So yeah, the ACS does have a really good personal career consulting program and they do have virtual office hours every Thursday at 12 to one o'clock Eastern time. And if you need help on, on developing your networking skills, optimizing your LinkedIn profile, also if you need advice on dis discussing your career options, um, resume, resume um, developing your resume skills, um, strategies on doing well on an interview, um, these, these are great sessions to attend to help you with your professional development. And the next session is on April 22nd. Other, other benefits of being an ACS member includes attending national meetings, ACS regional meetings, green chemistry conference, as well as affiliated meetings. So I just wanna share uh, um, this slide. Um, this was a, uh, um, so this slide shows results from interviews that was conducted by senior executive members from the chemical and pharma industry. And they're asked, what are the most valuable non-technical skills for scientists? And I mean, these skills are, are definitely applicable for engineers as well. So the top two skills are collaboration and communication. So we certainly encourage you to find ways to develop these um, pertinent skills that are very useful in the job market. So now I like to, I guess, before I introduce Caitlin, I like to, I guess I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Julian Bob and I'm a postdoc at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And I'm currently serving as the younger chemist community chair for the Virginia ACS section. And, and co-hosting with me today is Fatima Mustafa. So Fatima, if you'd like to give a brief introduction of yourself. Of course, thank you, Julian. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Fatima Mustafa. I'm a PhD candidate actually right now 
at the Clarkson University in upstate New York. I serve as the chair and co-founder of the Northern New York Anger Chemist Committee, and I also um, I'm a member of the International Younger Chemist Network, which is an international network for younger chemists as well. Uh, nice um, seeing you all tonight. Thank you, Fatima. Mm -hmm. So now, so Caitlin, she's my um, one of she's one of my lab mates in the lab, and our lab bench is just right across from each other. And I mean, she's been a really good lab mate. Um, she welcomed me in the lab, and she's always there to. Ha um, she's always there for. Um, helping me out whenever I have any questions. So last Friday, the, the College of Engineering at Virginia Commonwealth University published an article about Caitlin's. Um, so I guess she had a, I guess since she was giving a talk today, they featured her on, on their LinkedIn profile as well as they posted an article on their website. So Caitlin Shell received her bachelor's degree in chemistry as well as in chemical engineering from Virginia Commonwealth University. She's currently a third year PhD candidate at Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of Chemical and Life Science Engineering. Her research focuses on developing bio-based electrode material from agricultural waste residue. She has developed her own projects incorporating phytoremediation as a technique to naturally embed catalysts for the activation of biocarbon. When she's not in the lab, she has She's found working on fabricating our tiny owls, which she has designed herself. Um, Caitlin has, has also published recently three, um, three co-authored um, papers. And so, so during this presentation, we ask that you use the chat function to um, ask any question that you have. And also after Caitlin's talk, we will have a Q&A session. So Caitlin, if you'd like to, it started. I'll hand it over to you. All right. Do that. Excellent. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Caitlin Shell, and Dr. Bob is correct. I um, uh, received my undergraduate degrees at Virginia Commonwealth University, and now I am a PhD candidate. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about a day in the life of a green chemical engineer. Disclaimer, this is more or less, you, you know, in what's going on in my life. This isn't every green chemical engineer, um, but it does give you some idea of what is going on. So today's outline, I'll go over um, my background, uh, where I'm from, academic history, and, and some of my hobbies, you know, sort of get to know me. Um, and then I'll go over, you know, what is green engineering? I, I know many of you in the chemistry field know a lot about green chemistry. Um, and it's actually quite similar. Um, and then I'll go over my research area and I'll end my talk with some tips for graduate school if you're thinking about graduate school. And then we'll go into the um, Q&A session. So a little bit of information about me. I'm from Batak County, Virginia. And if you don't know where that is, that's okay, because not many people do. Um, if you know where Roanoke is, it's slightly north of there. Um, my family has been there for many generations. Um, I went to the same high school as my parents, if that gives you any idea. And it's a very rural community. Um, there's a lot of farmland uh, and so forth. So um, I actually, in high school, I went to an engineering academy um, in 11th and 12th grade, and I finished up my associate's degrees at Virginia um, Western Community College. And then I came to um, VCU. Um, so I obtained you know, my undergraduate degrees. Uh, during my under, undergraduate career, I held an internship um, slash co-op um, at Afton Chemical in the process development um, department and chemical sciences. So at some point I switched over, which is perfectly fine because I learned a great deal about industry from both of those um, departments. And I'm very thankful for those internships. Um, and then I also, um, while conducting my internship slash co-op, I conducted undergraduate research in um, Dr. Rambi Gupta's laboratory. 
And after I graduated uh, with my undergraduate degrees, I decided to stay in his lab. I, I liked the atmosphere. I liked his work. Um, so that's where I stayed. So some interests and hobbies, things I, I really like to talk about. So uh, you may know that I am working on a uh, tiny house. Uh, I designed it using AutoCAD um, and it's made to look like a miniature Victorian because I also like architecture and Victorian architecture is um, my favorite. So why not make a house, um, you know, as how I would want it. And I'm working on it with my significant other, Taylor Nelson. And when we're not working on the tiny house, we're going on a, a quite a few adventures. I ride motorcycles. Um, as you can see in some of the pictures, I've, you know, had three different motorcycles at this point. I've been riding, I actually rode dirt bikes as a kid. Um, so riding, you know, on the road wasn't too much of a stretch. Um, and then I really like going hiking, kayaking, road trips, uh, as you can see down here. Um, so that's, you know, a few things about me. And if you have any questions about, you know, the tiny house or motorcycles, you know, I'm always uh, willing to answer those. Um, so I'll go jump in here. Uh, what is green chemical engineering? Well, it's pretty much, you know, engineering in a way that you're reducing your footprint, reducing CO2 emissions, um, pretty much just, you know, making the world a better place for lack of a better, uh, term, but, um, give you an idea here's some areas in green chemical engineering that you can look forward to. So, you know, you have um, biotechnology, this is where you use biological processes for industrial purposes. So um, I know uh, one person on a grant that I'm on uses enzymatic hydrolysis. Um, so using enzymes to break down um, cell walls. So that's one area and you have environmental engineering. So that's where you, you know, create solutions to protect the environment. Um, you know, you, me, any living creature, um, there's waste management, waste management, that's where, you, you know, try to reduce your waste, and then there's clean energy, and this is where you want to develop low carbon emissions, um, and different energy products and conversion processes. So, I know many of you are in um, green chemistry. Um, green engineering is pretty similar. I know there's a lot more scale up processes. There's a lot more energy mass balances there. Um, but pretty much it's, you know, try not to use hazardous materials. You want to, um, prevent instead of treat. So you don't want the waste to get into the environment. You want to use renewable materials, um, sustainable materials, so forth. And you want, you know, surprise, you want to keep your processes pretty simple. Um, the more steps you have, it's more likely more waste you're going to have. Um, and here's like the engineering part where you use mass energy, you know, want to reduce your space um, and uh, just, you know, use sustainable uh, processes. And I, one thing that I notice in engineering is that, um, or at least green engineering is that you do a lot of life cycle analyses to see how you're going to affect the environment around you. So the area that I'm in is clean energy and I'm very enthusiastic about it because I've always been obsessed with, you know, how things move. I grew up working on cars. I work for Afton Chemical, which if you don't know, is a fuel additives and lubricants um, company. Uh, and then now I work on what's called super capacitors. And if you don't know what that is, it's okay. They're not super well used. Um, but uh, within the realm of clean energy, I work with energy storage. So here we have four different types of energy storage and they're plotted on this beautiful plot that I created. Um, right here. And um, so pretty much to explain this, um, specific energy is how much your product can hold and specific power is how quickly you can discharge that energy. So capacitors don't really store a lot of um, energy, but they can discharge very quickly. And then if you don't know, fuel cells store a lot of energy, 
but they don't really discharge very quickly. Um, capacitors store energy in the form of ele electrostatic separation. Um, supercapacitors can do the same thing, but they can hold about a million times more energy than a regular capacitor. Um, and they can still discharge within seconds. Um, some other, or there's two different types of supercapacitors, um, EDLCs and, and pseudocapacitors, and pseudocapacitors store energy in the form of bonds, much like a battery. So that's where you get this, you know, nice bridge here. And then both batteries and fuel cells store energy in the form of bonds. So here's some applications of supercapacitors. They're actually becoming more prevalent uh, with each day. The main usage is in um, hybrid electric vehicles and they're mainly used for regenerative braking. So here you pretty much aid the battery in your charge and discharge cycle. So taking energy from the wheel, putting it through the energy management system um, and either sending it to the supercapacitor or the battery. Now, the reason you'd want to send it to the supercapacitor first is because supercapacitors super can charge and discharge about 10,000 times. A battery, you're good for 300 times. And if you want to put that into perspective, think about your cell phone. It's like how quickly or uh, how long do you have a cell phone for? Some people, maybe a year, two years. Um, and you probably charge it at night. So pretty much it goes through one charge and discharge cycle each day. Um, and after, you know, a year, year and a half, two years, you know, start to notice that your battery is kind of not holding as much as it used to. Um, so that's why you'd want to use supercapacitors with the hybrid electrics. Now, not as prevalent here. We, you can use supercapacitors for phones, tablets. I think they're still working on that. Um, and then of course, microgrid systems. And the reason you wanna use that, use supercapacitors in a microgrid is because if you're using a microgrid, it means you have a specific energy demand um, or a specific energy need and supercapacitors can help you know, meet that need. So what are these supercapacitors made out of? Well, you have well, I'll explain, you know, how they're put together. You pretty much have two electrodes um, with a separator in the middle and there's electrolyte in between. Um, right now, uh, commercial supercapacitors use petroleum coats for graphite carbons. I use biomass. Um, biomass has, uh, if you don't know, lignin is a very carbonaceous compound and there's an abundance of it in nature. Um, but there are different biomass sources. So um, we have agricultural residues. That's pretty much like your crops, like corn, stover, you know, parts of the wheat plant you don't use. I know some people have been working with coconut, you know, so forth. Um, animal waste is another area. I know this sounds gross, but you can take the fats, the furs, the manures and turn that into um, you know, a carbon template. Um, I do not work in that field, so I really don't know how they do it, and I don't know how they deal with the smell, so, you know, that's something different. Um, there's woody biomass. I know the um, USDA um, is trying to find uses for their forest byproducts um, and paper mill byproducts, and then the last would be fermentation products. So this is taking, like, fermented grapes from wine, um, oats, yeast, you know, pretty much anything. You can make alcohol just out of everything, but you know, um, there's still a solid product there that you could use. Um, so now that we have the biomass sources, you know, it's like, where did I come into all of this? Um, so I started in Dr. Gupta's lab in the fall of 2018. And I'll tell you, I didn't know anything about supercapacitors. I didn't know anything about the field. Um, so, and it was like, oh, you know, I'm hitting a learning curve here. So first thing I did is start reading papers about it um, and replicating experiments. And luckily there was somebody in the lab um, who really helped me. 
Um, he was a very good mentor. Um, his name is Dr. Rodine. And I definitely learned a lot from his advice. Um, so after, you know, I replicated synthesis experiments, um, I finally learned how to make an electrode. And I remember the day I made my first electrode, tested it, um, and he gave me feedback. He's like, this is probably the best electrode uh, we've had in over a year. And it made me very happy. Um, I didn't care if he was lying or not. Uh, um, so, you know, after it was demonstrated that I could make an electrode um, and, and make this biocarbon or this, you know, carbon that's made from biomass um, material, then it's like, okay, let's start tuning some process parameters. So if you don't know, one of the best ways you can convert biomass to um, an electrode material, which I call biocarbon, um, you can burn it scientifically and in a tube furnace. Um, the key here is to not have any oxygen present. So I use argon. And what you do is, you know, here's a, I can uh, get a pointer here. Okay, so the one main component that we want from this biomass is lignin. So here is a beautiful lignin molecule. Um, and there you have all these OH groups, you have, you know, your car carboxylic acids, your chemists, I know you know, um, that, you know, all these functional groups. And essentially what you want to do is get rid of them. Um, you want pretty much just carbon. And, um, and I know you get some residual oxygen. Um, but for me, I mainly want the carbon out of the material. And you can see there's a quite a, you know, few carbon elements in this molecule. Um, so like some of the process parameters that I started tuning was temperature, um, use catalysts, you know, how long uh, it would stay in the tube furnace and then like ramp rates for heat. And once you find those parameters, it's, uh, it's like, okay, let's go on to the next step. So the next step for me was being placed on a Department of Energy funded grant. And on this grant, we're not looking at just biocarbon. We're looking at uh, biofuel precursors, lactic acid phenols, um, biocarbon and nanofiber mats. And you would think we'd have to look at several different materials, several different biomasses to get these. Absolutely not. You can make all these from just one plant, and that would be corn or corn stover. And if you don't know what corn stover is, it's pretty much every single part that we don't use. So um, the husk, the stems, the leaves, we don't eat that. So we don't, you know, have a use for it. And we can take this corn stover and through this wonderful maze, which I did not make this, um, the writers of the grant uh, put this beautiful graphic together. So, um, but pretty much you take the corn stover and you wanna send it through a pre-treatment process. And that sort of breaks down the cell walls and then uh, it gets sent, you know, through several different processes, but eventually, uh, the solid residue, as it's you know fondly called, uh, gets sent to me, and this is what I can make the biocarbon from. And it's you know, by the time it gets to me, um, some of the those functional groups have already been cleaved, and what I'm looking to do is cleave the rest of them and then graphitize it. And this is where you take the carbon and put it into these nice little layers. And that actually increases the conductivity and increases the um, capacitance of those uh, electrodes. Oh, and so while I was working on this um, DOE funded grant, uh, I was sort of coming up with my own project. So I knew I didn't just want one project throughout my whole PhD career. And I was forwarded a paper um, from Dr. Gupta about you know, a group who had taken plants and sort of grow, grew them in um, a catalyst in a metal doped water, just to see what happens. And it was, you know, not basic, but it, it, you could definitely see there was room for improvement. And so 
what I did and I, I love plants. So, um, I have about 10 different plants growing in the lab and I know Julian sees them every day, um, me watering them and so forth. But I wanted to take these plants and actually see what the optimized doping would be. And so if you don't know this area, it's called phytoremediation and the application of it is for mining remediation. So, um, there's a lot of mining sites, let's say that, you know, you're mining for nickel or, you know, just any mining site and you get these contaminants in the soil and it actually ruins the ecosystem. And while phytoremediation isn't new, applying it to energy storage is. Um, so yeah, we, we can go over some definitions. So phytoremediation is using plants to remediate soils. Um, and it's actually, the area is about 40 years old. So like I said, it's not new, it's well studied. People have taken all kinds of different plants. There's actually a database by the University of Queensland um, where they figured out all the different plants that are can uptake specific metals. These are known as hyperaccumulators. Um, and so one day I just went through that database and picked out some plants and and I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to use these plants um, because they uptake, let's say, nickel. Um, turns out some of those plants are very rare. And I did some further research and the plants you see in this picture is water hyacinth. And it's an amazing plant. It's, it's well studied, uh, but not for this purpose. Um, there's some studies that have said, oh yeah, water hyacinth is a great hyperaccumulator. We can use it for soil remediation, you know, once we burn it and, and so forth. And I was like, uh, no, I have a better idea. Um, and so I grew these plants in different concentrations of nickel to see which concentration um, best or most enhanced the um, material when, you know, going from plant to battery or super pastor. And it works very well. I, I don't know who all is in, um, let's say, working with materials that um, you're looking for high surface areas, but using the metal catalysts um, to naturally embed uh, helps increase that surface area quite a bit. I think I was able to obtain a surface area of 3,400 meters squared per gram. Um, so it works quite excellent. And in fact, it works excellent as uh, energy storage material as well. And I could probably go on for the next decade talking about this, but I'll move on. Um, so all of this bench scale, you know, stuff uh, doesn't mean much if you can't take it to the next level, aka pilot scale. So um, right now I am working on a scale up process for the DOE grant. Um, it can be applied to the FIDO project, um, but I'm still kind of tweaking a few things there. Um, but pretty much what we're doing is taking this, let's say this is the bench scale schematic and putting everything into a, you know, large scale. And then to put this into perspective, I can create about, if I work really hard, about a gram of this biocarbon a, a, per week in the lab. Um, the next level for me is taking that one gram per week, turning it into 150 kilograms per day. Uh, so it's quite a feat here. And that's where we're at in the project now. So we've sort of moved away from bench scale, moved it to pilot scale. And um, so you can see my beautiful PNID um, here. And what you, if you haven't done the scale up, you know, before, um, you're pretty much finding it, finding an industrial way to, let's say, for a tube furnace. Um, they don't really make uh, economical, you know, large scale tube furnaces. Um, so here I've put in place a box furnace and then 
you know, you have centrifugation, you have um, part of my process is acid washing to remove contaminants and, and so forth. And um, for that, we sort of had to come up with a um, filter system that acts as, you know, new neutralization, filtration, sort of decanting the, the water and so forth. And that's what's pictured here. Um, and that's, I actually had to collaborate with a company in India to give them, you know, my specifications and they came back with, um, this setup and, um, we don't have it yet. We're still actually trying to find a place to put everything because, you know, we're taking, you know, bench scale to, I think this piece of equipment, the filter is probably about nine feet high. It won't fit in the lab. So you have to find an external company who's willing to let you set it up. And so the last thing I'll talk about, um, you know, for me is the techno economic analysis that uh, is sort of in its infancy right now. Um, but it's very important. It's pretty much saying like, okay, I've done all this work. Uh, is it even economically feasible? Um, so here we're looking at spatial analysis. Um, and this is where you take GIS software or um, and look at you know crop yields, labor availability, cost of living. Pretty much, it's like you know if I were to build something in Richmond, it would probably cost a lot more um, than building it in the middle of Nebraska, where cost of living is probably a, quite a bit lower. Um, and then you're also looking at equipment cost because uh, you know you need the equipment to run your processes, and you want to also see you know about your economic out. Outlook. So you want to see, all right, I'm getting all this product. How much can I sell it for? Um, and, and then you have transportation costs. It's like, how much does it cost to get from one place to another? How much does it cost to get your materials? Um, labor costs, you know, you're paying some, probably paying somebody, you know, a chemist uh, a lot more than, um, you know, the staff that cleans your equipment and so forth. Um, and then the last thing, well, maybe not the last thing, but um, you have your maintenance costs. So, you know, how much piece of equipment breaks, how much uh, is it gonna cost to fix it? How much is it gonna cost to maintain it? Um, and so forth. And the last thing I actually didn't put here is your material costs. But in my area, material costs are actually quite cheap because since you don't, nobody has a use for, you know, let's say corn stover, it sells for 50 bucks a ton, which is very cheap, dirt cheap. Um, I could buy a ton tonight if I wanted to, and that's saying a lot. Um, so that's sort of like where we're going in the future. And to give you like some perspective of how long it took me to get here, I, like I said, I started in the fall of 2018. Um, had to learn pretty much everything I know now. Um, and then being placed on the DOE project and, and so forth. And then probably early 2019 is when I was able to start tailoring my process parameters. Um, and then throughout 2019, that's when I was sort of, you know, getting into stride with my work, um, going to conferences and all that. And, um, and so by the end of 2019, I think that was the first conference I had ever gone to. So it was pretty nerve wracking. Um, and I had to explain pretty much everything that I'd learned in the previous year. Uh, and then moving on to 2020, uh, that's when I was conducting my own lab scale um, experiments, um, almost working all the time on the DOE project. And then mid 2020 is when I started working on the FIDO project. Um, and near the end of uh, 2020 is when we started working on the pilot scale. So a lot happened in 2020, um, pandemic and all. And then moving on to 2021, we're trying to further refine the design of the pilot scale. I know one thing that I need to work on is this, you know, recycling of uh, reagents. And then um, later this year, I'll be working on the TEA and manuscript writing. And so in the future, uh, right now, I am planning on graduating this December. We'll see. Not everything goes according to plan always, but um, 
you know, fingers crossed. Um, and then once I graduate, I definitely want to go apply what I've learned um, in industry because what use would it be otherwise? Um, and so I now is where I have to give thanks to my research group. You, everybody may know Dr. Bob. Um, this lovely woman right here is Jethryn. Um, this is my advisor, Dr. Gupta myself and then we also have a postdoc in our lab right now who joined probably about seven or eight months ago um dr um gain pendy uh and then um last but not least well not quite but um i do have to give thanks to the institutional collaborations um the doe grant that i'm on um it's not just VCU, as you saw in the um, wonderful maze picture. Uh, we are collaborating with South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, Old Dominion University, Idaho National Labs. So it's quite a large project and everybody is an expert in something that I'm not and that the next person is not as well. So it makes for um, a great group and a great project as well. And I do have to give thanks to uh, my mentor throughout, you know, my first couple years, Dr. Rodin. And then um, most recently, I was able to be a mentor to um, Mr. Sean Fora, um, who is no longer in the lab. He's actually um, started a career teaching. So that's uh, wonderful for him. And I'm very proud of him. And so I'll end this talk with... Uh, some graduate school tips and uh, tricks. Um, I know some of you are maybe thinking about graduate school, so I definitely want to put this in here. Um, first off, mental health is important. I hear all the time, like MIT students, eat, sleep, drink in the lab. Don't do that, please. I do not want to hear about that. Go home, take a shower. Um, so some mental health things that work for me, meditate, take, take breaks. I know everybody hits a wall, um, go outside, smell the flowers. And then last but not least here, you know, have a hobby. If you like to draw, draw. If you like, you know, to apparently make tiny houses, do it. I fully recommend it. Um, and then, so next, you know, choose your advisor wisely. I know some students get burned out. Maybe what their advisor wants of them is not what they want. Um, so I highly recommend working in that lab if possible before committing to that advisor. Um, that way you'll know what they expect of you. You'll know the research area, so forth. And this is one of my favorite things. If you don't know the answer, please ask. Um, my significant other, we both get caught up in this sometimes. We uh, will be like, no, nah, I don't, they're gonna think I'm stupid if I ask. Go ask that professor. They will probably be fine. They'll, you know, they're good. If you, even if it's the smallest thing, um, especially in your classes. Um, and then learn something outside your field. Personal note here, I don't know of a single person in chemical engineering who knows anything about GIS. Um, maybe that's my school, um, but uh, I decide I, I like looking at maps, you know, simple as that. And so I actually took a class on GIS, um, which I guess I forgot to say it's like geographical information systems. Um, where you take maps and you can analyze them and actually make draw conclusions from them. Um, this actually turned out to be a wonderful asset, at least for myself, because nobody in my group knows how to do anything with GIS. Um, and it's now required in our you know, project. So you never know how you might apply it. And um, there's probably many more tips, but these were like my top. Um, four, I guess. Um, so with that, I will end my talk. I invite you to ask me any questions, whether it be about grad school, not grad school, you know, whatever. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Caitlin, for the great talk.
Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop the recording now. I guess Fatima, if you like to take over with the Q and A session. Mm -hmm.